Hey, coming up on Tech News Weekly, Jason Howell and I are here. And we start things out by talking about that Facebook hack others are talking about. It might be old news to Facebook, but experts disagree. Carrie Paul from The Guardian explains. Plus, we talked to Sarah Morrison from Vox about dark patterns on the web, the ways they get you to buy more, spend more, and uh, everything in between. Before we round things out with Tate Ryan Mosley of MIT Technology Review, who talks to us about beauty filters and their impact on young girls and women. And of course, our stories of the week. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 178, recorded Thursday, April 8th, 2021. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And on the other side of the screen, I'm the other host, Jason Howell. How's it going, Micah? It's going well. I'm propped, I've propped up my uh, emotions with plants and Excellent. I am, am feeling good. I'm feeling good. <laughs> good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do um, it. You know, d- despite feeling good uh, sort of internally, externally, there may be a concern uh, for folks who have heard about 533 million Facebook users being uh, having their data exposed. Um, I imagine that by now has made its way around to the uh, more general news sector. Uh, but there's a little bit of um, back and forth between Facebook uh, and and sort of whether or not uh, they see this as an issue. And I think that that statement in and of itself is enough to to warrant some some pondering. Uh, but the whole breach as a whole, I think, is a, a very interesting story. And so today we're joined by Carrie Paul, who's written for The Guardian about this breach and um, included uh, some some sort of clapbacks, as you will, from experts. Welcome to the show, Carrie Paul. Hi, thank you for having me. Yes, we are happy to have you here. I think uh, the best place to start for everybody is with the breach itself. Uh, Could we talk about kind of when this happened, uh, what data was was taken or what what data is in this data set and anything we have about how uh, this, this data was actually gathered up? Yeah, so this data, um, as we are discussing it now, it broke um, by Business Insider last week. Um, They just reported that there was this giant trove of user data from Facebook circulating around some hacker forums. Prior to that, it seems like Motherboard may have reported on it a bit um, earlier, though it didn't um, exactly report exactly how many Facebook-related accounts there were. So basically, this has been circulating around the internet for a while, but we're just now hearing about it. Okay, yeah. So um, that's that's kind of the big thing there, right? Is that um, this has been around for a while, and we we're just now hearing about it because of is it because of the the news uh, places that have have reported on it, or was this kind of known in uh, the security sector? I would say it was known maybe on some select hacker forums, but I don't think it was widely known in the greater security world um, and definitely not by users or journalists. So um, definitely the reason we're talking about it now is because of the Business Insider story, which has then forced Facebook to respond to it. Facebook, of course, is doing its usual PR song and dance where they're saying, this is old news, it's old data, we've already fixed it, we fixed it in 2019, don't worry about it. Um, But of course, uh, experts have some different thoughts. Yeah, let's talk about that. So that's one of the... the (laughs) I find that fascinating because uh, if I were to go to my, uh, my younger brother right now and if for some reason I could convince him to tell me his password... Um, for Facebook, I have a feeling that um, that information, including, and I, I know that you know their their phone numbers, it's Facebook IDs, full names, locations, birthdays, email addresses. 
it, this data itself didn't include passwords, but the information that one that a person uses on one site is often the same information that they use on other sites. And I think that that's kind of the one of the, the big arguments here is that if that data was stolen, uh, it, it's a little disingenuous for Facebook to call it old, right? Right. A lot of this information is not information that can be changed. So obviously it's terrible when passwords are leaked, um, but at least you can do the usual security precautions. You can go through all your accounts, change all your passwords. We should all be using password managers anyway. So theoretically, it would be very easy to switch up. Um, <laughs> you can't change your birthday. Um, people don't often change their cell phone numbers. So it's very likely you have the same phone number that you had in 2018 or 2019. Um, so the fact that Facebook is saying this is old data is just, yeah, a little bit disingenuous. So are you telling me that the reason I've been getting... Um, almost daily messages from uh, someone out there who's telling me that I uh, have won an Amazon uh, best best customer of the month award uh, that is then followed up by an email from the United States Postal Service telling me that my package was uh, is, is available to schedule for redelivery with some link to some site that is not could be because of of, of this Facebook link. I mean, what I'm asking here uh, is... What is it that cyber criminals can do with this data uh, and, and how can it be used kind of nefariously? Because I think that when folks hear about this and then they hear no passwords were leaked, their first thought is like, oh, well, that's good. It's just my email address. It's just my phone number. But what can this data be used for, as you point out, because people don't often change it or in some cases, you know, you can't change it. Uh, what, what, can, what can this data be used for? Yeah, like you said, people tend to think that if it's not passwords, it's not a huge deal. But um, a lot of things can be done with your phone number and a lot of things can be done with your birthday. As you mentioned, spam calls and robocalls are out of control. And this is definitely something that contributes to it. Um, often there will be large leaks of data tropes like this. Um, and people can just buy them up on the dark net for, you know, 99 cents a number. And then they're calling you constantly. Um and I talked to one security expert who said, forget being hacked. It's just annoying. Like, even if they don't <laughs> get a hold of any of your stuff, you're getting these phone calls constantly. And we all know what it's like to get these, like, spam calls all day long. So that is irritating for people. And then it can also be, go, be a lot worse than that because you can get a text message from someone uh, pretending to be your bank. Um, and it's just extra nefarious the way that Facebook has done this because they do require that you sign up with a phone number for Messenger, for example. A lot of times they really push you to put your phone number in and they should have an obligation to keep that secure if they're going to force you to do it. And a lot of the reason you put in a phone number is so you can have two-factor authentication, you can have extra security. So it is a really bad look that these extra security measures at Facebook have now been used to compromise people's security. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, 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 I guess my, you know, the, the big question here is what does, what, what can we do, if anything, uh, when it comes to something like this? Is this really uh, one of those situations where there's no protection or not, not very many protections on the user's part? And at the end of the day, it all comes down to what the, what the company does or how can we kind of, uh, deal with the the uh, blowout of, of of such a breach mm -hmm. yeah there's there's a couple things you can do and then in the way there's not much you can do but um, you can go to have I been pwned.com or have I been zucked.com and you can see if your information <laughs> has been compromised in any of these um, as I said you, you can change a password but it's hard to change your birth date or your phone number so that um, there's in that sense, there's not much you can do, but if you look it up and see that you have been included in the breach, you know, it's, it could be a warning to you to be extra vigilant if you're getting texts from random numbers. Um, and also as I, some of the sources I spoke to mentioned, we should all be kind of pushing for better privacy and security regulations on all levels. That's kind of something that you can do as an individual, um, a lot of people argue that because Facebook is such a huge monopoly and because it has so many antitrust issues, that's why it just continues to have these breaches and kind of doesn't seem to care about it. It's almost like a too big to fail situation. Mm. Um, so if we ever were to get meaningful regulation um, out of Congress, then that might address some of these major breaches that we've seen. 
Understood. I think that's one of the bummers that I see here with the way that this played out, especially with the news today that's been you know circulating that Facebook doesn't intend to notify any of the people that were involved in this about about it. Is that accountability aspect? Sure. You know, when this happened, whenever it was a year ago, however long ago it was, Facebook made the patch and, you know, secured their system to protect against this going forward. But that's more than 500 million people's contact information that they may or may not ever know why they're getting all those spam calls, why their account is, you know, potentially uh, being impacted or hacked because of a phone number that leaked out and Facebook not being accountable and just like at least addressing them. I think this is this is one of those examples or this is an example of a large data breach where the company who really, you know, had is trusted to hold on to that information and keep it safe and everything is doing little to show its users that it respects them in the sense that, hey, this happened to you and uh, we want you to know. Instead, it's like you got to read the news in order to know and we're not going to say anything to you if it happened. I just think that's a horrible precedent. I don't know how you feel about that. Right. Yeah. And I think not only is it a horrible precedent, it's also perhaps illegal because Facebook should be notifying under, you know, there's a number of breach notification laws, whether it's in the EU or certain states in the US um, that require Facebook to let people know. And actually as part of a FTC settlement that it made um, in 2019, I'm not sure if it applies because this data allegedly was leaked before then, but it should be notifying people within 30 days if there's a breach. So they may have also broken the law. We're not sure. So they are in contact Mm -hmm. with um, Irish regulators as well as I think maybe the FTC. So they may have some additional uh, fallout from this coming up. Yeah. Now, that's interesting. We'll have to keep an eye on that for sure. Um, Mm -hmm. Carrie Paul, I want to thank you so much for taking time uh, to join us here today to talk about this. This was a big data breach. And uh, I think that it's important to look at how Facebook is handling it and uh, whether it's still a very important thing. Um, Of course, we can find your work over on The Guardian. But if folks want to follow you online, where do they go to do that? Um, you can follow me on Twitter. It's K A R I underscore Paul P A U L, um, and the at sign. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't forget the at sign. Don't forget the uh, at. <laughs> well, thank you again for joining us. We appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank Karen. you. All right, and thank you, Carrie, for that. Up next, what in the world are dark patterns? Well, you know, been hearing about dark patterns for a while now. It's actually a term that that was uh, that was made back in 2010, so it's not a new terminology. But I feel like there's more awareness around dark patterns right now for a number of reasons. We're going to talk all about those reasons, what they are, and how, at least in California, anyways, there's uh, some protection for them or against them rather. Sarah Morrison uh, writes for Vox.com for Recode and wrote an article that really does a great job. Job of explaining dark patterns online. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing awesome. Even better now that you're here. Thank you so much for hopping on with us today. Oh. We really appreciate it. Sure. Um, so let's, uh, let's, of course, start with the basics. People may have heard the term dark patterns. It sounds so malicious and like nefarious. And I guess to a certain <laughs> degree it is. What exactly are dark patterns? So they're basically the tricks that uh, web designers mostly, but you know, other ways that you know websites and apps use to uh, sort of manipulate or coerce you into doing and making the choices they want you to. So a lot of times it's you know shopping websites, uh, wanting you to buy things, maybe buy a couple extra things. I cover privacy for uh, Recode and Box, so a lot of my focus on this is getting you to say yes, I want to be tracked. Uh, you have ads targeted to me, um, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, and you know, there's a lot of just very subtle ways that, and some not so subtle ways and some egregious ways and some like, you know, less egregious ways that they can do that. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting reading through your article, I, you know, kind of going into it thinking, oh, dark patterns is a very specific thing, but it's actually not like it covers a lot of ground. And in many ways, 
some of this, some of these uh, behaviors are happening in a way that people, when they're faced with them, might not even realize what's going on or not. And I guess that's why they are actually somewhat nefarious. Like, what are what are some of the more common ways that any average user is faced with this, whether they realize it or not? How is that working for them, like from an like experiential perspective? <laughs> I think the things you come across the most are when you uh, give your email to sign up for an account and like the I want newsletters is like automatically checked off. So you're like opted into getting a newsletter. You probably maybe wouldn't have wanted it otherwise. Uh, the, uh, the thing I use is, you know, Instagram saying, do you want to have a more personalized ad experience? And then one button that clearly Instagram wants you to select is like much more prominent and obvious uh, and, and attractive. And then the one that's like, no, is like, you know, a lot harder to see. So, uh, like that's the one that visually you're going to be attracted to. Uh, if you've gone to, I know I've gone to this like guitar site and every time I go there, they're having a sale for 80% <laughs> off and it ends in like four hours, but it's been, I mean, there was a Thanksgiving sale, a Christmas sale, there's a spring sale now. And it's always about to end. Uh, or if you're shopping for something and they're like, there's only two more of these things left. I mean, that might be the right. truth, but if it's not, you know, they're going to kind of pressure you into buying something and make an, a decision that you think you need to make right now. Uh, so, or just, you know, uh, I think hopefully maybe a thing a lot of people come into uh, account lately is I signed up for a gym and then, you know, the pandemic happened. So I needed to cancel my subscription only to find that like I signed up online, I could upgrade my account online, but when I came to canceling, I had to actually go into the gym in person yeah. or send them a, a certified letter. So if they make it a lot harder to opt out of or cancel something, then they made it to, you know, opt in or subscribe. That's, uh, that's also a dark pattern. Mm, interesting. So, so much range, uh, between, yeah. between these things and some of them, some of them you could arguably say, oh, well, that's just like a, like a, a smart marketing decision yeah. to make that button sure. that you really want people to either see or not see just a little bit smaller than the other buttons. Yeah. In other ways, though, it's downright kind of like, you know, deceptive uh, and can be. And you, you mentioned yeah. the uh, the guitar site that always has the sale going on. That just reminds <laughs> like, I'm sure every town has that one store that's like forever going out of business. It's always having <laughs> yeah. an, you know, going out of business sale. And yeah. it's like, yeah. all right, it's been two years. When is it happening? When is the sale done? When are you out of, actually out of business? It's kind of the same thing in real life. Yeah. Uh, but one thing you write about is cookie consent pop ups. And man, we're seeing these yes. everywhere. Yeah. Um, how, how does that become a dark pattern tool? Yeah, actually that probably is the thing that people see more than anything else. I should have led with that. Um, it basically, you know, there's some laws that say, you know, you have to tell people that there are cookies or, I mean, depending on where you are, give them options to not, uh, you know, to, to opt out of them. So most websites don't want you to do that because they, they want you to, opt into having these cookies that track you around. It's how they make some of their money. Uh, so when they have to present people with that choice, they sort of make accept all cookies, like a lot more prominent, a lot more obvious. Uh, the thing that your eyes are going to go to first, the thing you're just most likely to click on. And then if you don't want them, the like the client all might be harder to find. You might have to go to like a control panel and sort of look at them individually. Uh, when I was doing research for this, I found that Forever 21's like opt-out panel, they actually did a thumbs down emoji <laughs> for, I, I, I want to see bad ads because I'm going to opt out of tracking cookies. So, uh, so they sort of shame you into that. Yes, it's a shame that, tool. As well as, yeah, as well as making it uh, a lot harder to, to do. And if you just think about the way people use the internet, um, I mean, cookie pop-ups are just, People are just like, I just want to look at a web page and every web page I go to, I have this thing. So it's just, okay, 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 yeah. okay. I'm just going to do the thing that's easiest because I just don't even care. And then there's all these words about what cookies are that I don't even understand or care about. Uh, so yeah, so the cookies, and especially because I do privacy stuff, again, the cookies are the thing that can be very privacy invasive. So the, the, that's the intersection, I guess, of my of my beat, <laughs> dark patterns yeah. and privacy. The cookies are the it most prominent, obvious example. Yeah, absolutely. And then actually, and you mentioned this um, when we were kind of setting up this interview, there's totally, you know, there's news that happened last week or sorry, last yeah. weekend 
Trump was using, uh, it was reported that Trump was using dark patterns for collecting donations and talk a little mm -hmm. bit about how that went down. Cause that's kind of a step further that involves, you know, bringing in money, which yeah. I mean, to a certain degree, I'm not saying that what he did was fraud, but to a certain degree, yeah. dark patterns could be used in fraud like behavior. Yeah, I mean, that my article came out like I think two days before this one, uh, which then presented like this really great example of a couple different kinds of dark patterns and then the like real world harm that they can potentially cause. Basically, you know, I think anybody who's been aware of, of anything over the campaign season, Trump, his campaign, like his emails are just very aggressive and like there's a lot of them and they will um, they will say things like if you don't donate in the next, you know, hour, you're going to miss this 8,000% match or something. And uh, so they then still a sense of urgency. Uh, the thing that was that this, you know, highlighted uh, this article highlighted the most is that they would say, you know, donate. People would think they were donating one time. Uh, and then there would be like a box automatically checked that said, make this like a monthly donation or do like a double donation bomb or <laughs> something like that. And then you can even see over time, as they became more aggressive, the like wording became like these like, longer and longer boxes with like harder to, you know, sort of get to where it says I'm going to be donating a lot of money um, over and over again. So there were people interviewed in the article who said I didn't even I thought I donated once. And then all of a sudden, I, I all of these like hundreds of dollars more have been deducted from my account on a regular basis. And I just didn't even know that wow. I mean, I had agreed to so many donations and they were, I think they said like millions and mil tens of millions of dollars in, in refunds, but you can, you know, also imagine a lot of people didn't ask for a refund, you know, for whatever reason. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, there's conceivably a lot of people who donated a lot more money than they thought they did. Um, and then I think after that article came out, the, uh, there's another fundraising email from, I think, using a lot of Trump's, the Trump campaign's practices that said, like, uh, if you uncheck this box and don't donate, we will tell Trump that you're like a defector to his cause. Right. Wow. So it's like, really like, do you really want do you want Trump to know that you personally uh, are a Democrat now? Like that wasn't exactly the wording, but it was very much the implication. So, uh, you know, and obviously these things are really convincing because, again, when they started using them, they got a huge jump in donations. Either oh, yeah. because people were like con con like shamed into not you know donating, or just didn't realize that they were donating like eight times. Yeah, and on something like that, suddenly it got personal. <laughs> like, oh no, 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 don't don't tell them that. I, I don't want them to know that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, like how yeah, how much is he actually being okay? So I've got a list. Here's like uh, five hundred thousand people. I'm just gonna start yeah. in number one, okay? Yeah, yeah they're gonna walk over to Mar a Lago and just sit him down <laughs> with like a large table. All right, it's like, time for some coffee. Good list, bad list. Yeah. <laughs> um, now there, uh, there is action going on uh, in mm. you know in in on the government level to. Uh, push back against dark patterns. California, namely, uh, is actively banning dark pattern practices. How exactly is this being regulated uh, in this state? I live in the state of California. Um, so like I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily, you know, notice immediately as I'm surfing the web that there are changes, you know, in place, but right. obviously there are. California is actively uh, pursuing this. So what are those changes? How is that visible to users? I think um, so. These are through privacy laws. So these are a lot of like the consent things and sort of concerns. You can't make it so much harder uh, to you know to opt out than it is to opt in. Um, stuff Got like it. that. You can't be uh, the language you use can't be like deliberately confusing so people don't quite understand. You just have to make it very simple. I think for people to know what they're getting into or not getting into, and just make it as easy to do one choice as another. So. Um, I think I've seen, um, like in Europe, there's some places now that will, the cookie opt out thing, like the two boxes, yes or no, are the same size, the same color. Uh, you know, they just, they, here's the two choices and there's no sort of influence on one or the other. Um, I know in a uh, Washington state, they have a privacy bill that's making its way through, uh, their, you know, Congress. And one of the things in it, one of the provisions is if you obtain consent, through a dark pattern, it doesn't count as consent. So, um, and you have to sort of, you know, define it. And the thing is, like you said, some of these 
are just sort of good business practices. Businesses want to sell people stuff. They want to make their right. product attractive. Um, so there is a big gray area between deliberately deceptive, uh, manipulative practices here and, you know, just being a good salesman. So I think uh, the privacy stuff's a little easier because with privacy, you're not quite getting a product that, you, you know, uh, so I think that's a good place for them to start. And I know the Federal Trade Commission is uh, like they actually do regulate and enforce, you know, deceptive trade practices. So they have gone after some companies that have done really bad examples of this. Uh, but they're also look. they have a workshop, I guess, this month where they're going to be talking about dark patterns, how they target certain communities, maybe solutions for them. And they do have ways to and they're clearly interested in uh, doing more here. But obviously, if we had federal legislation that gave them sort of more clear guidelines and enforcement powers, they'd be able to do a little more. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll be curious to see uh, if other states kind of follow in California's footsteps as far as that's concerned. And seems you, to be you think they would, that's, states, that's the way it they, goes. Yeah. States tend to follow California with a lot of laws in just a lot of different ways. California tends to be yeah. aggressive. So, you, you, you know, you hope so. Right. Yeah, absolutely do. Well, Sarah, really appreciate you taking time to uh, talk to us about dark patterns and uh, kind of illustrate exactly what people can look for and uh, know to not be fooled by the larger, smaller button thing at the very least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sarah yeah, Morrison writes for Vox.com yeah. yeah. for Recode. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. No All right. Bye. All righty. Bye-bye. All right. Up next, augmented reality filters and their impact on young girls. Super interesting article. Yes. Uh, this story is, uh, it's, it's, it's not just a story. It is an in-depth look at uh, the field of, of uh, face filters, of augmented reality um, overlays of lenses. They have a bunch of different names, but it is the overlay uh, that folks can put on their face uh, while they're using social media across so many different apps. By now, you've seen uh, bunny ears, dog ears, uh, hearts floating in the sky. Uh, but there is a conversation to be had around how this affects uh, girls and young women uh, in particular. And so joining us today is Tate Ryan Mosley of MIT's Technology Review, who wrote this really incredible piece about AI face recognition and augmented reality. Welcome to the show, Tate. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yes, we are happy to have you here uh, today. So let's, um, just in case, just in case there's somebody out there who doesn't know, could you kind of define the, the subject of this piece, the augmented reality, the filter, the lens uh, thing? What, what is that exactly? And kind of what was the focus uh, with, with this piece that you've written? Yeah, so that's actually a really great question. And it's a little bit more complicated than you would think. So um, the kind of general topic is the technology suite that is enabling an easier editing of photos and videos. Um, so, you know, for a long time, we've had things like Photoshop. Um, we've had, you know, Adobe Lightroom. We've had tools that have allowed us to tweak pictures that we're in and, and put them online. You know, what we started to see as we saw social media sites crop up um, in, you know, the 2000s and specifically moving into the 2010s um, was kind of this obsession with selfie culture. And so people were posting so many more photos of themselves directly online. And there was often an interface in between, you know, uploading a photo and actually posting it to a site where people could tweak, you know, what that picture looked like. And so, the subject of this uh, piece was kind of what that looks like today. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, very often these uh, pretty manual photo editing technologies um, have kind of transformed into real time video filters, um, you know, and so those lenses are basically, it's a form of facial detection um, and pretty advanced computer vision where a camera will detect a face, it will detect eyes, nose, a mouth, and it will kind of 
give uh, the option to overlay uh, effects on top of that that map to you know give you like you said bunny ears, a big mouth. Um, it'll you know smooth your skin, and and those filters will actually follow you in real time videos. Um, so you know the piece was definitely about kind of the, the entire phenomenon of these technologies, but really focused on the new age real time video uh, AR filters. Okay. Yes. That's. Uh, thank you for for defining that, and um, I'm glad that it ended up kind of being an important uh, point here. Uh, so I, I like how you kind of you start out this piece really focusing on uh, some some young women in particular, and kind of talk about uh, the the history and the growth of this this field. And I think that that is an important place to start because um, for some of us, especially in the millennial range, uh, who didn't grow up with screens um, in front of us, you know, for for a portion of life. It, it came later versus it being just there from the beginning. Um, we've kind of seen how that has changed over time. And for some folks who are uh, younger, I guess that would be uh, Gen Z and, and younger, uh, these folks are kind of have always used filters and have always uh, played in this, in this space, so to speak. Um, but I'm curious, kind of, in your your study of this and in writing about this, uh, did you see more of an impact or more of a focus on folks who, uh, like Gen Z, who grew up with it always, or is it more focused on millennial? Or I mean, is it just kind of everybody? You know, I, I think um, my my mom, who's a, um, I, what are you, Jason? What's your generation? Uh, Gen X. Gen you X. Know, yeah. I don't care about much. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Gen Xers, um, I've seen a few of them using filters, but not always, not entirely. And so I, I guess what I'm asking here is, is it kind of a, a generational thing or in, in looking into this, have you seen it kind of across the whole swath of, of folks and the impact of it, uh, if it's affected kind of everybody? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I think, um, you know, it was intentional that I started uh, talking to younger women who were looking back on their own use of filters when they were even younger. So um, the story talks about two sisters, Sophia and Veronica. Um, Sophia is now 16 and Veronica is 19. And they've been using filters for like four years. So, you know, when Sophia was 12, she says she first started using uh, face filters. And the retrospect that you get with them is this really, you know, speaking of them, I was just pretty uh, blown away by how thoughtful and how conflicted they remain to this day about their own use. You know, um, Sophia was saying, she was thrilled. She remembers when filters were released on Snapchat. You know, she remembers talking about it with her friends. It was a, a momentous, you know, moment in her adolescence. And now, you know, she looks back on pictures of herself when she was that age, when she looked much older in these filtered photos than than a 12-year-old, you know, now even having the perspective of a 16-year-old and feeling conflicted about that and, and what that meant for her. And I think, you know, the way they were using the technology, um, they were they were trying to be really thoughtful about the the use of filters in terms of what it means for their own mental health and self-esteem, but also what it means for their peers. And you know, they were really, really thoughtful about like how to how to exist in a digital space with other young women in a way that was supportive and not kind of um, uh, degrading or, you know, um, really impacting, you know, self-esteem. But I, I definitely think this is affecting everybody. So I think it's really important to say, one of the people I interviewed in this piece, her name is Caroline uh, Roca, and she's a creator of some of these AR effects on Instagram. And she was saying from her perspective, you know, and she's, she's older. Um, I would, I think she's probably an older millennial or, or Gen X, if I can guess her age. She was saying that, you know, for herself, she found herself getting addicted to them, uh, you know, always needing to have a filter on when she went online, always wanting to have her nose look thinner. Um, and she has a big social media presence. And so I think it's pretty interesting, you know, the the different risks. I think there's risk for everybody, but I think particularly with these younger people, um, the level of self-awareness you have about who you are and how you choose to present yourself when you're underage in particular, uh, I think is really different than when you're a millennial or a Gen Xer. 
Understood. One of the things that I hadn't considered that you um, that you have kind of touched on was the not historical impact, so to speak, but the um, archival impact. I guess we'll say uh, the fact that at, you were talking about the the young woman looking through her photos and looking mm. back on times when she was younger and she appeared older. Uh, now that I think about that, I wonder the number of people out there who, you know, they've taken photos of themselves and their friends and their family in these different situations. And is, you know, sometimes they apply filters during, um, there have been times when, um, my mom will take a photo and then she'll use, uh, an app afterward to mm -hmm. make adjustments. And, uh, me being, you know, kind of in the midst of, of tech and understanding how these different things work, it's kind of, it's an easy thing to pick out and go, Oh, you know, you, you adjusted that. And so <laughs> is there is there something there too to the 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 fact that we're recording history, but we're recording recording it sort of in an idealized way, and uh, does that have a, a an impact on identity itself with uh, the person looking at their younger selves and saying, you know, I was X age here, but I look X age. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think when I you know think about myself, um, you know, I as most young people do, you go through phases in your life and you represent yourself in different ways, depending on who you're hanging out with or what you're interested in or who you want to be for that moment of time. And that's a very like healthy and normal part of growing up. I think um, what we end up having is kind of the ease of transitioning through those different phases and the level to which we can tweak those uh, representations of ourselves has just uh, changed so much with technology. And then we have like, I love how you said like the archival uh, component of it because we're not just, you know, living our lives that way. We're post, most people are posting, you know, these versions of themselves all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think what you end up having is these artifacts of identity. Um, this is something that I talked to Claire Prescott, uh, one of the researchers in the piece about, you know, she's saying she was emo at one point in her life. She had like this very gothic stage and now she's um, a professor and she wouldn't want her students you know, so easily accessing those those stages of her life. And so, yeah, I absolutely think there's uh, a ton to unpack there that we we don't even know, right? Like this is a brand new technology. And I think, you know, you're talking about still photos. I think it's even more interesting when we think about like the amount of archival video we're going to have. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. this this touches this line of deep fakes when, you know, if, if I have videos of me at a birthday party celebrating my mom, but I'm filtered the whole time, what does that mean for the way I think of, you know, that memory? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. See, that's, that's, that I think is, is a whole nother level. Now, uh, one of the, the, kind of subheads that you have in the piece is about selfie regulation. And in it, you kind of talk about um, what thoughts about regulation and policy uh, have been, what uh, folks have considered, what they haven't considered. And so, yeah, I guess I'm curious, given the impact, uh, both potential and, you know, studied, um, I, I can remember a study about Instagram and its effect on uh, self-confidence and on, um, or how much of a, an impact it has on folks with eating disorders and things like that. There's clearly um, a lot of an effect that a social media network can have. And then you add these changes, these shifts to identity on top of that and, and sort of um, what we see ourselves. So yeah, can you talk a little bit about what regulations have been considered, what companies themselves are or aren't doing, and maybe what uh, folks have thought about changing about the way these work? Yeah, so this is kind of to no surprise, a really sticky area because we're talking in some ways about classic self-expression, right? Like the way you choose to represent yourself online and your freedom and right to do that however you wish. Um, and I think in some ways it's gonna be hard to argue for what regulation should look like when we think about it in, from that perspective. You know, if um, you know, I put on makeup coming onto this video cast because I knew I was gonna be um, on a video. Now, I think that if you were to have told me, you know, you can't do that. You need to, to come, you know, you're totally un, un you know, unmake up self, I would be mad. You know, that's not how um, we think about that freedom. And so I think we're, we're just in this, the sticky area where, where there's different perspectives from which to look at this. I think, um, you know, the other perspective is, uh, 
what's happening is the amount of content that's on social media platforms, particularly Instagram, and the amount of time people spend getting, you know, their news, getting, um, you know, forming relationships with trusted sources who are constantly filtered, we get into this this uh, question of synthetic media, right? So then it, it kind of shifts the discussion from, you know, we're having really realistic looking videos that are so easily altered by filters um, in a way that's kind of democratized. Like, are, are we going to be comfortable with that? I don't know. So, um, yeah, what what we see uh, now is just a lot of self-regulation from technology companies. I think it's really interesting that Instagram um, actually took away a, a category of effects for several months, uh, I think two years ago, called distortion effects, which are kind of a, a more dramatic uh, AR filter that actually tweaks, you know, the shape of your face, the shape of your features. Um, and they chose to do that because of some some backlash they were getting about the impact that was having on mental health. Um, I think the other thing to be really cognizant of, and now those filters are, are back, though. Um, I, I think it's important to say that. Um, hmm. But I think it's just, you know, the amount that we don't know about this space and is overwhelming when you compare it to the use. And so I think so many more conversations about regulation and research about the effects of this technology need to be had. It's wildly understudied. Hmm. Um, well, uh, I, I want to, to thank you for a taking the time to look into this, to, to write this piece. Um, I think everybody should head to technologyreview.com to check out uh, this story about beauty filters um, and, you know, to, for us to continue to be aware of how this is impacting folks and how it will continue to impact folks. Uh, Tate Ryan Mosley, thank you for joining us today. If folks want to follow you online, check out the great work that you're doing, where should they go to do that? They can follow me uh, on Twitter, like all journalists, at uh, <laughs> Tate, Tate Rymo. Tate Rymo, excellent. Well, thank you again for taking some time today to speak with us. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. All right, folks. Up next, our stories of the week. And we start with Jason. Jason, what is your story of the week? Oh, yeah. Not much of a story. I just realized that I have a product that I'm starting to play around with and uh, thought I'd kind of tease ahead a little bit. A uh, pair of headphones, actually, which are called the Urbanista Miami over ear headphones. Are you familiar with Urbanista as the brand? It's kind of a yes. brand that's just now. Yeah. So the, I've heard, this, I've this heard about a, Urbanista. This yeah. is a brand. Yeah. Swedish audio brand. And I would say, you know, I've, I've, I've tested some of their other products before, but this is the first over ear headphone that I've, that I've tested. And, uh, definitely like it's a focus on style. Like a lot of their, a lot of their, um, their products are very stylish, but also on value. So these, these very nice quality uh, headphones, I might add, $149. And they're really kind of meant to uh, kind of compete or, you know, seem to compete very, um, very well with headphones that cost a lot more, like at the Apple AirPods Max, in other words, although the Apple AirPods Max are crazy expensive by comparison. <laughs> so this is quite a deal uh, in comparison. But they offer um, some very similar features. Notably, you get some active noise cancellation with these headphones uh, that work really, uh, really nicely, actually. It's some, some nice um, isolation fits really snugly on the ear. So you get that kind of like that nice seal uh, and then the active noise cancellation uh, happening to kind of reduce the noise around. So not a bad feature to get. And we're starting to see the, the noise cancellation uh, come into play in headphones of all different price categories, which is a great feature to see, in, you know, in not just the premium of the premium uh, headphones. Um, these, of course, are red, which <laughs> Eric in chat is uh, is asking if it comes in other colors that he might actually like. I don't <laughs> mind the red, uh, but they come in a lot of, like I said, it's it's a style brand to a certain degree. So they uh, definitely offer a lot of other more vibrant colors. Let's say there's a green that's really vibrant. Uh, definitely the kind of headphones, you know, the kind of um, gear that when you're wearing it, 
people people see them right it's not meant to just blend into the background um but you know the base wise you've got a nice uh, aluminum uh, housing, a brushed aluminum housing that looks really nice in person when the light, you know, kind of hits it, uh, has a nice effect to it. And, uh, yeah, down on the bottom, you can see, I'm trying to do this backwards. It's hard to preview and do this at the same time. You do have the, uh, regular audio in input. So while these are Bluetooth five, um, earphones, you can choose to go wired if you like. And I love to see that on Bluetooth uh, earphones, on full-size Bluetooth earphones. Um, it's always nice to have that option because sometimes sometimes going wireless isn't my preferred choice. Or if we're in the car and we want to play some media for, for the girls on the, the built-in system, I'd rather them connect wired. And so it's nice to have that option to do it. Uh, you've got some controls here, of course. Uh, for, you know, managing your playback and everything like that power. And it does charge via USB-C. So the charging is, is pretty fast. Um, as for sound quality, I would say these are pretty, um, pretty good for electronic, good for pop. There's a definite emphasis on the low end, uh, which is not overblown. It's not like you put these on and holy cow, my, my eardrums have exploded uh, sort of emphasis, but you can definitely tell that there's a little bit of a hyped lower end, which works really well for certain types of music. Like I said, you know, hip hop, uh, pop, electronic, you're going to get some really nice, uh, nice bumping bass out of these with that kind of music. Um, and then battery life, this is rated at 50 hours on a single charge, which is pretty bonkers. And you have to imagine that that isn't uh, that wouldn't be while active noise cancellation is happening. Obviously, that number is going to go down if you throw some noise cancellation on uh, at the same time. But 50 hours is pretty darn awesome for a pair of wireless headphones to charge yeah. it and then get 50 hours of, of rated use. Um, not bad at all. So yeah, I'm putting it on right now just to just to kind of wear it um, because my ears are cold. See, and so yeah, it's now, nice earmuffs. Yeah, nice earmuffs that also play music. So, anyways, I thought they're interesting. Uh, definitely enjoying playing around with them. I plan on doing a full review of these on all about Android. So I don't know if it's going to be next week or the week after, but I've got it coming up soon, and uh, I had it in my hands. So and on my head. So I thought I'd show it off. The Urbanista Miami over ear headphones. That's that's them. What do you use for your headphone listening, Micah? What's what's um, like your go-to? My go-to are just my AirPods Pro. Um, they are easy to to pop in. They connect to my phone immediately, and then I can listen to stuff. And uh, but I I'm kind of a I've got different pairs for different situations. Um, I'm currently wearing uh, the... I, they're a very popular Sony over-the-ear uh, noise-canceling model, and I can't think of what these are, but these I use for my podcasting. Mm -hmm. And I also occasionally, when I don't... When my ears get uncomfortable with my AirPods Pro in, then I will put these over the top or... As you mentioned just moments ago, if my ears are cold, uh, I'll sometimes put these on as well. <laughs> and then I also have a very cheap pair. There's a company called iFrogs. And um, I don't even know if it's still around, but iFrogs makes these headphones. It's got like a band that goes around your neck. It's open in the front. So you just kind of slap it on and it, and it hangs. So it's like a horseshoe shaped. So you just put it on oh, okay. your neck and the controls are on there. And then two wires lead out to two earphones that you put in your ears. And I like oh, those yeah. if I'm doing something um, particularly active where my AirPods Pro won't stay in my ears, those do stay uh, where they're supposed to be. And they don't sound great, but they the, it's the functionality of them. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I like those things a lot. And then um, for a while... I also regularly used some in-ear Bose Quiet Comfort earbuds. Uh, I don't use those as much anymore because the noise cancellation on AirPods Pro is good, and so yeah. it kind of replaced that. But uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of all over the place with headphones. 
for sure. Nice. I so am I. <laughs> it's kind of a sickness at this point. Um, I can I can never like settle on just the the one right thing. I've got this for that use, this for exactly. that use. Exactly. Like, yeah, it, it totally is that way for me as well. But anyways, so yeah, that's the Urbanista uh, Miami and looking forward to, um, I don't know, I like, I like what the company is doing. I think they they do the budget, the, the more budget minded um, audio hardware really nicely. Um, I like what they're coming up with. So I'm curious to see more and yeah, I'll share a review on all about Android in the coming weeks. Cool. What you got for your story of the week? Well, you know, sometimes companies do things that you wonder are April Fool's jokes. And then you realize that if they were April Fool's jokes, they would be such in, in such poor taste that there's no possibility that they could be April Fool's jokes. And then you think they should be April Fool's jokes because there's no reason why these things should exist in the way that they do. And one of those things happened uh, this week. Actually, it, it came out a while back, but it's getting um, attention because somebody saw like a it was a you know some presentation at a company uh, a conference rather, and so they saw this uh, this new service, this new bit of software from Intel. Um, it's called Bleep, and it is a tool that is meant to help um, help kind of block hate speech online. But here is the thing. Let me go ahead and read here from this Vice article, a paragraph. A video of the app shows that it will allow users to customize what kind and how much hate speech they want to see, including racism and white nationalism sliders that can be set to none, some, most, or all and a separate on and off toggle for the N-word. So mm. what we've got here is a tool that on its face, great. It helps you block hate speech. You don't have to see hate speech online. You don't have to see hate speech uh, in you know while you're gaming and stuff like that. That's great. But there's a slider that lets you get some white nationalism if you want it, most racism if you'd like to see it, and if you just want to, you know, everything else, you want to go ahead and see all the white nationalism and racism, but you just don't want to see the N-word, then there's a separate toggle for that. Um, it is, so this is, I shouldn't say see, I should say hear, because it's um, an audio-based, so it, it basically stops people from uh, hurling slurs at each other. Um, it, it says the, the, the app will present users with a list of sliders, uh, including ableism and body shaming, LGBTQ plus hate, aggression, misogyny, name calling, racism, xenophobia, sexually explicit language, swearing, and white nationalism. So here's the thing. I could see this being used as a tool for uh, adults um, who have, I should say parents, um, who are wanting to let their kids play games online, or maybe their kids already do play games online. And I tell you what, from when I was a kid and I remember, um, I, I never, I'm not a gamer, but, um, family members were hearing those Xbox live chats. Um, mm -hmm. there's some colorful stuff that takes place there. And Indeed. so I could see something like this being great for a parent who, uh, you know, is letting their kid play the, play whatever game they want to play, but is looking for a way to kind of protect them from these slurs and things like that. Uh, yeah. Because the fact is those slurs are going to be out there and they're going to exist. And I think it's important that people are educated on what is, you know, what's being said and the impact of those things. Um, but in an environment where uh, you're, conscious mind is focused on, focused on gaming and, you know, your brain is hearing all of these things. Like there's, there's uh, an impact there. Um, so this is, I don't know. Uh, I see why a company was looking at a way to solve this, but on the face of it, a slider for white nationalism, just, it just doesn't, I don't know that uh, the, the rollout of this is quite good. <laughs> yeah, putting xenophobia as a setting, like do uh, more xenophobia. Yeah. Uh, cool. Click here, and you will see plenty of it. I don't know. Having having that as a setting, I I, I feel the same way as you, Micah. Like, on one hand, I can 
kind of I can understand, like I can see the pathway that led to here and kind of maybe what the intention is. On the other hand, it's there's something about it that that just doesn't uh, that's discordant to me that that, that just does not seem quite right. Um, And I don't know. And I don't know what it is. Is it is it the the fact of leaving this as a as an option for anyone to select on their own? Like I would imagine to a certain degree, some of this happens behind the scenes on social networks anyways. Well, like when we're talking about like text-based social networks, filtering happens. There's certain, you know, hate speech that is that is flagged and removed. So in essence, this is kind of that, but for audio and democratized so that anyone can choose to do it for themselves. I don't know what the difference is there. Like, I guess, like, uh, I'm, I'm all for giving people more control over things than less, but there's something discordant about this. And I'm not sure, really quite sure I can, I can verbalize it quite yet. Um, it, it, here, here's the other thing that Vice points out. It is, uh, it, as they, they kind of say, okay, so you've done this, but what you're doing by doing this is saying, look, we can't deal with the racist folks that are there in the chat. Um, you know, we, we can't remove the, the, we can't, um, stop these racist players from being here because we need them playing our games because they're part of the, uh, active, uh, active monthly users or whatever it happens to be. So instead of getting rid of them and thereby removing some of our customers, instead, what we'll do is just make it so you can just mute them. And so they say, uh, just mute me which is what uh, folks back in the day used to say whenever someone would say, will you please stop saying that or stop you know, using those words? Those are not nice words. Here's why. They would say, just mute me then if you don't want to hear me. Uh, that's going to become, just use bleep if you don't want to hear my racist slurs. And so, yes, it's, it's like, we don't want to get rid of these players, so we'll just let you mute them because we need them to stay there and be there. And it's not something that we want to address and it's not something we're ever going to address and we give up on that part of it. Uh, so instead of addressing it in that way, we'll just slap a tech solution on it. And I think that that is uh, a fascinating mm. thing. By the way, Intel did not um, respond to requests for comment. Mm. Interesting. That's fascinating. I had not heard about that. Uh, very interesting. I wonder if we're going to see more attempts like this, you know, in kind of like crafting a system. If Intel gets blowback on this, is there an, is there a follow-up system that does it differently or does it, uh, air quotes better? What does that look like? You know, what does that lead to? I'm not really quite sure, but yeah, it's fascinating. Hmm. All right. Well, we have reached the end of this episode of Tech News Weekly. Uh, so thank you, as always, for watching and listening. We record this show live before a not-studio audience, before an internet audience at twit.tv slash live every Thursday starting at 11 a.m. Pacific. We've got an active chat room, people uh, pitching in uh, while we're doing our interviews and talking about these stories. So you can be a part of that if you like. Uh, but most people get this show in podcast form. And if you go to twit.tv slash TNW, you can subscribe in audio and video formats. And then uh, you'll just get it magically uh, into your podcatcher of choice. You can also follow us on social media. We are at Twit on Twitter, at Twit.tv on Instagram, at Twit Talk on TikTok. Um, you can follow me on pretty much, uh, well, all the social media networks I can find at Micah Sargent. <laughs> uh, um, and of course, check out Smart Tech Today later today, which I do with Matthew Casanelli. And tomorrow uh, with Rosemary Orchard, iOS Today, plus uh, both Jason and I have been filling in for Leo this week. So you can check out yes. uh, earlier in the week, some of the shows that we covered for him while he was out. What about you, Jason? That's right. It's been a, it's been a busy week. Uh, looking forward to Leo returning to work. Although I hope that Leo has had a great vacation away. Um, I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter and yes, uh, I, you know, as Micah said, we've been busy this week, so you can find, uh, Micah and I on all sorts of shows. I was on, uh, this week in Google yesterday, had a lot of fun with the crew there, uh, security now the day before. And then of course all about Android and everything else. So, uh, twitch.tv and just search for the shows. You'll probably 
Casey, Micah, or I on the show's mm-hmm. produced this week. Uh, big thanks to everyone who helps us do this show each and every week. Uh, Burke at the studio, John Ashley at the studio. Uh, you for watching and listening, for without you, we would not have a show. So thank you so much for that, and we'll see you next time on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands on Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday, that is, I like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop. It's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon.